We were just saying Jesus knows all about our struggles. I surrender all. Amen. There's a message in those songs. We all have struggles. We all have things that we wrestle with and bring us strife and trouble. But surrendering them to Jesus, that's the answer. That's the key. I testified earlier that this has been a wonderful morning and that it's been a good week. It's also been kind of a hard one. It's been kind of a heavy one. There's been things that I've had to labor over, not just in work, trying to raise money and take care of a home, but I mean, there's always that. And I've come across people this week that have had some really heavy pain, really troubling pain. They call me on the phone, Pastor, will you pray about this? I certainly will. I certainly have. Pastor, can you come stop by and visit me? I, I just got to have somebody. To, I, I got to get this off of my chest. I'll be right over. It's been a good week, but it's been a hard one. But it's been made easy through the truth found written in God's Word. One of the things that I did this week was have a small meeting with some local pastors. And they were, they were discussing some of the things that were taking place at their churches. How the church attendance seems to be falling off. The young people are hard to reach. We got one right this bicycle here. This blesses me. Bless me. Thank you for your faith. And they began to they began to talk about different programs that they found on the internet. And one of them had gone to a pastor's conference, and at the pastor's conference, they were giving them some helpful hints and ideas about how to grow your church and how to reach the youth and how to minister to the elderly. And then there's that in between age between the young and the old that we've got to care about. And, and um, they had a whole list of uh, activities that you could do at the church throughout the course of the week and how each and every the individual activity is geared to a certain age group of people. And I said, here's a novel thought. I, I personally believe that the problem with our church world today is that we have escaped and gone away from expository preaching. Where we just open up the Bible and let the Word speak for itself. Follow the Holy Spirit and speak what He lays on your heart. Here's a novel thought. Why don't we just get back to preaching the Bible and trust the Lord for our churches and our congregations? Amen. And I was told, you know, Pastor Thad, sitting here at this table with all of these men, it's a true statement. Every one of us love your heart for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it just blesses us so much. But this is 2022. You have to have other things. Let's not replace the Bible, but let's add this. And I told them I would rather preach to 10 people and stay true to the Word of God Amen. than to preach for 10,000 and compromise the Word of God. You see, it's the Word of God that gives us power. Why do we get the power? Because the Word of God is true. And what does the scripture say about truth? You shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. If you need freedom today, freedom from sin, maybe you're as lost as a goose and headed for a devil's hell, and you need freedom from the burden and bondage of sin, the truth about Jesus Christ will set you free. Amen. Christ shed his blood on Calvary's cross. To forgive and to save the wretched lost sinner of which I used to be. If it wasn't for the old rugged cross and the blood of Jesus Christ, my life would be totally different right now. If I even had a life. If you're here today and you're struggling with a circumstance in your life, a situation 
that you have no control over, a worry in your heart, the loss of a loved one, Jesus Christ is the answer. I believe he gave me a message this week. I'll open your Bibles with me, if you will, to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Say amen when you're there. Amen. Amen. That was quick. <clears throat> I told you about it at the beginning of the service. And the Bible says, I love saying that. I just love saying that. I love getting up here and telling you, and the Bible says. I'm not going to get up here in front of you and say, I search Google, and Google says. <laughs> trust who I mean think about it. its name is Google that sounds like peanut butter or something <laughs> didn't we used to have peanut butter I might be aging myself go ahead well my daughter's raising her daughter from Google so we'll see how this turns out <laughs> <laughs> I, I might be aging myself mentioning the peanut butter called Google isn't that the stuff that it, it's either peanut butter and chocolate or is it peanut butter with jelly in it? Peanut butter jelly. Blue Okay. Close enough. Close enough. Close enough. All right. Well, at least how many of you remember the old cartoon in the newspaper in the in the in the newspapers, Barney Google and Snuffy Smith? Yeah. I'm sorry, after after watching that cartoon and reading that cartoon for years, I can't take anything serious that his name is Google. Although we, we Google a lot of things, don't we? I am so glad to be able to stand up in front of you and tell you, and the Bible says, because that is the root of truth. And the Bible says, in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and I'm going to start reading in verse 1, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. Paul is speaking to the Corinthians and he's letting them know that God has given them a ministry and that he's going to be faithful to the ministry because he received mercy. You see, Paul was known as the chiefest of sinners. How in the world could he, you know, down home, I hear this every now and again when I run into somebody that still holds a grudge on me. How in the world could a man like you be preaching the gospel? I knew you when. I say, yeah, but you don't know me now. Praise God. I'm no longer the man I used to be. And I'm not yet the man I'm going to be. But praise God, I am what God made me. Amen. Amen. But this isn't just written for Paul. And it's not just intended for me. You too have received mercy from God. Do you understand what mercy is? I think I've tried to teach this here before. But I'll just recap a little bit. We are saved by grace. We're covered by grace. But people oftentimes mix the two terms up. We just put grace and we put mercy together in the same sentence and we just think it means the same thing. You know, like, there can be two different words that mean the same thing. Well, grace and mercy do not mean the same thing. We are saved by grace. Grace is what saves us from our sins. Grace, in a nutshell, is Jesus Christ. Jesus is God's grace that came to this earth to open the door of salvation that we all might be saved. We are saved by grace, the Bible says, through faith, that not of yourself is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So there is saving grace. And I'm thankful today for God's saving grace. Say this with me. There's saving grace. Saving grace. But there's also keeping grace. Say keeping grace. <laughs> it's by God's grace that you are kept. Amen. And that will put you on shopping ground. I don't know what will. We are kept by the power, by the grace of God. You are kept. You are kept safe in that car with the. <laughs> okay. And those uh, real close signs. Amen? You're being kept safe. Even though the devil wants to attack your mind about your dad, you're being kept by the grace of God. You were kept this week in an automobile accident. God kept you. You're kept. Your salvation is kept by the grace of God. How nervous would you be if you were the one that was hanging on to your salvation? You might grow weary. You might grow tired. You might fall. You might drop it. You might lose it. You know, I was at work one 
one day, and I'm standing up at the counter, getting ready to run my paperwork. Just when I come in off of an order, I have to turn my paperwork in, and then when I get ready to go back out, I've got to get my new paperwork and get everything together and get the stuff set. And I'm standing there at the counter, trying to find, and you know I can't see. I can see, but I'm trying to read something. I can't read anything anymore without glasses. And so I'm standing there at the counter, and, I'm, and I've got my packet that I'm getting ready to go out with, but I can't find my glasses anywhere. And I'm shuffling through pages, and I'm moving things around, and it's on the sales counter, and my boss is standing there, and he says, Dad, what are you doing? I said, I can't find my glasses. And he reached up on top of my head. <laughs> I lose stuff all the time. Sometimes I think I've lost it and ain't really lost. My glasses. The other morning I was getting ready to leave for work. And I am frantic because I'm thinking I'm going to be late. I'm going to be late. I'm busting around the house and now Laura's working midnights and so she used to be the one that would stand in the middle of the house and I'm pacing back and forth and she'd hand me this and oh, thank you and I run over here and she'd hand me this. Oh, thank you. She used to set me up. Now I gotta say, I'm not used to it. I'm the guy that needs to be taken care of. I've come to realize that. She works hard to take care of me. I'm getting ready to leave the house. I don't have Lord doing this for me anymore. And I'm frantic. I actually picked up my phone and called my boss and said, I'm sorry, I'm running a little bit behind. I might be a little bit late today. He said, that's all right, Dad. Just get here when you can. And I'm running around the house. I can't find my truck key. That was in my hand. <laughs> Golly. Sometimes I lose stuff. Sometimes you'd see me just drop my glasses. That happened at the perfect moment. I didn't intend for that. That wasn't a visual to help you with the message. Sometimes I just drop Sometimes I got the Baptist drops. Boom, I just drop stuff. I'm so glad that I'm not the one that has to keep hold of my salvation. I'm glad today to know that God keeps that for me. Amen. 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 Praise His holy name. This wasn't just for Paul, and it's not just a message for me because I'm a, I'm a preacher. This message is for you. Grace is grace, and mercy is mercy. Grace is what saved you, saves you. But God's mercy is what keeps you from being destroyed. Amen? My sin should have destroyed me a long time ago. Back when I was lost and undone and living in this world and drinking and fighting and carrying on, getting thrown in and out of jail, my mama told me one day, I don't know what's keeping you alive. And for the first, I was lost. I didn't know Jesus. I knew who he was, but I didn't know him. And if I would have died back then, Jesus would have no doubt said, depart from me, you worker of iniquity, I don't know you. And Mama was one of the ones that always crammed the gospel truth down my throat. But for the first time, I was able to look at Mama and give a godly answer. Even while I was living ungodly. She said, I don't know what's keeping you alive. I said, yeah, you do, Mama. You've taught me about God's mercy. You see, God's mercy is what keeps us from being destroyed. I'm so thankful for God's mercy. Amen. Paul said, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry as we have received mercy, we faint not. You see what Paul said? He said, I'm not giving up. I'm not going to stop believing. I'm not going to stop trusting. I'm not going to stop serving. I'm not going to faint. I'm not going to fall. I'm not going to... He said, I, I'm not going to faint. Say this with me. I will not faint. Amen. Amen. Say it again. One more time. Amen. We will not faint. We are not of those who return again into uh, perdition. But we are of those who follow Jesus Christ and His Word. Verse number 2 says, But have renounced the hidden things of 
dishonesty. Not walking in craftiness nor handling of the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth. You see, preaching truth is paramount. Commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. The scripture says, you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. I'm just going to tell you, I am more determined now probably than ever before to go after every lie that the devil is trying to plant within the churches. Amen. Our pulpits are falling for it. Our pulpits are compromising it. And if the pulpit ain't right, then the pews won't be right. And one day when I stand before the Lord, when you stand before the Lord, you're going to take account of your life. Of every deed you've done in the body and every idle word that has ever come from your mouth. But I, if I fail to open up the Bible, read you the Word of God, and just follow the Holy Spirit and preach with spirit and conviction, I will stand and answer for every false message that I've ever preached, and your blood will be upon my hand. I refuse that. I won't let that happen. I got nothing to answer. I got nothing to answer for on my own. I don't want to have to answer for you. But I know that it will happen. So you don't have to worry about you know, that's another message for another day. You can just trust and know that I'm always going to be reading from the Word of God and letting the truth do what the truth does. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Now, gospel is another word for truth. The truth about Jesus Christ. The gospel. Paul saying, if our truth is hidden, it is hidden from them that are lost. I don't know if my message is so much for every... I love to preach messages that encompass everyone. From the lost to the saved. From the man to the woman. From the boy to the girl. I don't ever want anybody to walk away from a service that the Lord has allowed me to declare His Word in and say, well, I, there wasn't really nothing in that message for me. So I try my best when I'm preaching to encompass everybody, but I feel in my heart today that today's message is intended for the church. When I say the church, I don't just mean Omega. I mean the church, the body of Christ. It doesn't matter to me if you're Baptist or Lutheran or Methodist or Pentecostal or Catholic or whatever it is you are, your denomination is not the church. That's right. Those who have heard the gospel believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, believe that He died on the cross for their sin, that He was buried, resurrected on the third and appointed day to give us hope of eternal life, ascended up into the heavens where He's seated at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for the church, and then He's coming back for the church with those who have been washed in the blood, filled with the Spirit, and their names recorded in the Lamb's Book of Life, that is the church. Not this beautiful building that we're sitting in. Not the comfortable pews that you're sitting on. And it's certainly not the fact that you're non-denominational, or Methodist, or Baptist, or Pentecostal. The church is the body of Christ. And that's, a, that's another truth that needs to be proclaimed from every pulpit from here to Tim back to back. If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Well, I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to put you on the spot. This is a way. And I'm not trying to separate the sheep from the goats or the wheat from the chaff. And I'm certainly not trying to make anybody feel like you're not. Heart. But if I ask for a show of hands as an open testimony, how many of you in here would say today, I've repented of my sin. I've asked Jesus Christ into my heart and I am saved. I could raise my hand on that. If you've raised your hand today and that is your testimony that you are saved, then you're not lost. 
If you're saved, you're not lost. Amen? Amen. If you're saved, you're saved. You're not lost. You can't be lost if you're saved. And I'm saved. And you're saved. Well, the Bible says, if the gospel be hidden, it's hidden to them that are lost. If you're not lost, then the truth is not hidden to you. Oh, man, if that don't put you on shouting around, I, I feel like kicking my shoes off and just preaching barefoot today. Because that is some barefooted truth and basic. I won't do that. I promise. You're not lost. And say this with me, the truth is mine. Amen? You have the truth. Now the devil can't tear you down if you got the truth. Amen. The devil can't wear you down if you got the truth. The devil can't keep you from sleeping at night if you've got the truth. The devil can't overrun your life with worry and doubt and fear if you've got the truth. If you've got the truth, then you know that God is faithful. Amen. The devil right now is telling you, I don't know how this is going to work. I know that you believe in the power of prayer. I know that the church, I know that the preacher. But you got to take a look. I mean, you got to be a realist. Are we serving God through intellect or are we serving Him through faith? Faith. Amen. Say this with me. I know what it looks like. But it ain't what it is. <laughs> Amen. That's some truth that you can sink your teeth into. Amen. Praise God's holy name. Verse number four. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves. They ain't nothing that turns me off quicker than hearing some preacher get up and brag and boast about all that he's done and everywhere that he's went. And I got invited to this church and I stood up in front of them people and I told them this. And I told them, God, my gosh, why don't you go get on TBN or something? I just can't take that. I can't take it. People ask me all the time, how come you don't tell us what you're doing? Because why do you need to know? You tell me everything you're doing? Well, no, it's in the pastor. Okay, here's the thing. When I get home, I plan on receiving a crown. I plan on getting my reward. And Jesus, Jesus talked about them Pharisees that go around being all, I don't know if this is even a word or not, but I'm going to use it. Jesus talked about them Pharisees going around everywhere being all braggadocious. <laughs> Talking about everything that they did and how good they are and how righteous they are and how many devils they cast out and how many people they laid hands on and all this other stuff. You know what Jesus said about that? Jesus said, do what you're doing and do it in private. Go into your closet, close the door. The things that you do in private, God will reward you for openly. The Bible tells us to not, don't let our left hand know what our right hand is doing. You see, if I go around bragging to everybody all the things that I do and all the things that I'm involved in and how many people I'm actually ministering to throughout the day, you know, he doesn't even visit. You don't want that. Well, I ain't got a phone call from the pastor. Check your voice, man. We've got voicemail for a reason. Some of y'all never, some of y'all never answer your phones. I make the calls. I leave the message. You know what I should start saying? They never call me back. <laughs>
than to see the reward from that. Amen. Don't be a bragger. Don't be a bragger. Bragging comes from pride. And pride is one of the seven sins that the Lord hates. You know, we talk about the drug addict. We talk about the meth addict. We talk about the drunk laying in the gutter. We talk about the murderer. We talk about the thief. Pride is one of those things that God has put his finger on and said, I hate, I hate this. Don't be a bragger. Give God the glory. Paul said, we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. Whoa! That every, you know what? Every pastor in America, every pastor in the world right now needs to read verse number 5. Yeah. I am not the head of the church. Christ is the head of the church. I'm not the ruler over all. I'm, the ser I'm your servant. People got a bad, people got a wrong idea about who the pastor is and what his role in the church is. I'm not up here calling the shots. Jesus does that. I serve Jesus. And I learned a long time ago the only way you can serve Jesus is by serving people. This ain't about me, this is about you. I'm here to bless you. I'm here to encourage you. I'm here to lead you to Jesus Christ. I, I, I'm here to serve you the Lord's Supper. Now at the old home church, they used to do a foot washing. <laughs> if you try to do a foot washing in a local church today, I tell you what, people, I, if I ever do that, I promise you this, I'm never going to announce it the week before. <laughs> I'm just going to show up one day and there's going to be some basins of water. Would he really do that? Well, I would if I thought the Lord was leaning on me to do it. But I would be the first one to come down out of this pulpit and grab a hold of your foot and wash it. I wouldn't kick my shoes and shoot socks off first and sit down and say, I'm the pastor who wants to begin this and put my foot in the water. I'd wait till you took yours off and I'd say, I'm the pastor. Who wants to be first? I'm your servant. And here's the thing. If you're serving Christ, that makes you a servant. We're called to serve. Paul says, we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves, your servant for Jesus' sake. Who God, uh, for God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Now start paying very close attention. These next few verses are going to lead me into the message that I have for you today. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Do you know that you are an earthen vessel? That's what you are. That's what I am. We are earthen vessels. We were created by the hand of God from the dust of the earth. The Bible says that God formed man out of the dust of the earth and breathed in his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So man was created out of the dust of the earth. Always blesses me when I think about that. When God created all that we have and all that we see, he spoke it into existence. Let there be light, and there was light. <coughs> Let there be a firmament between the heavens and the earth, with the, the sky, with the clouds. He spoke the birds into existence. He spoke the animals into existence. He spoke the water. He spoke the grass. He spoke the trees. He spoke the air. We breathe. Everything he spoke into existence but man. See, that's where the Genesis creation comes in. We didn't form from amoebas. We didn't used to have flippers that turned into arms and legs and call, man, that's something on a late night movie thing to think about it. Didn't come from apes. We didn't evolve from anything. There's no Big Bang Theory. I believe in the Genesis creation, that God created everything, including us. In His creation, He spoke it all into existence until it came to man. The one time 
In all of the creation, there's one time that God didn't speak it, but God worked it. He put His hands. He got His hands dirty. He physically, literally formed the body of man. He wanted it to be just right. And then He put Himself by breathing the breath of life into man's nostrils. Man became a living soul. Why? Because God is the source of life. You were so important to God that He didn't just speak you. He said, yeah. no. I'm going to do this with my life. And He made you. That is beautiful to think about. That is beautiful. You are an earthen vessel. You were made and created from the dust of the earth by the hand of God. So when Paul says we have this treasure in earthen vessels, Paul's saying we've got this treasure that's on the inside of us. A treasure is something you can't put a dollar amount on. It's worth more than you can even fathom. And that treasure that's on the inside of us is the truth of God. It's the Holy Spirit of God. And God's truth. So if you have the Holy Spirit, if you have that hidden treasure on the inside of you, you have the truth of God. That why are you pounding away on the word truth? You're going to understand here in just a moment. We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power there brings me back to the truth of God's word. That's where we get our power from, knowing the truth, that the power may be of God and not of us. We are a fickle people. We believe one thing today and another thing tomorrow. Amen? Amen. Amen. We got people that show up at church and say, I'm just believing God that He's going to give me a job tomorrow. The next Sunday they show up, I don't believe there's a job out there for me. Well, are you going to believe God for the job or are you going to believe your emotion? I'm so glad that we're led by the Spirit and not by emotion. The Spirit never changes, but our emotions are fickle. We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power, you see there's power and truth, may be of God and not us. Say this with me, the truth is power. Amen. amen. We are trouble on every side. Somebody shout amen. amen. Ain't that the truth? <clears throat> Everywhere you look, there's trouble anymore. We're troubled on every side, yet not distressed. Ooh, preacher, don't sit down on that one, please. We get so distressed over the things that are happening in and around us that we have no control over. We say God's got this, but we don't mean it. Because if we meant it, we wouldn't get so distressed about what's going on around us. Oh, how yeah, about you know what? No, I do understand. I'm not, I'm not making light of anything that you might be going through right now. And I, too, have been so distressed. There's, there's some hard stuff in this world. And you see it happening to other people, and you think, oh, the poor folks, but once it starts happening to you and your family, hey, that's a game changer. That's when the distress sets in. Let me edify you. Don't let the distress take over your life. It's only normal that you're going to be concerned. It's only normal that you're going to react in a certain way. My goodness, it's your son or your daughter, your wife, your husband, your mom, your dad. And it doesn't make you an evil, sinful, wicked person if you happen to fret a little bit over somebody that you love. It's okay. Don't let it overtake you. Because that's not okay. Keep your faith. And no matter what happens, are you always going to love Jesus? Yes. Are you always going to love Jesus? And Jesus asked Peter the same question three times. I'm going to ask you the same question a third time. Are you always going to love Jesus? That means you're going to love him no matter how things turn out then, right? Mm -hmm. So you've got to trust him. 
And you've got to believe in His truth. We're troubled on every side, but we're not distressed. We're perplexed. We don't understand. I'm confused. We're perplexed. But I'm not going to despair about it. You know what? I have come to understand that I don't need to understand. That took a long time getting there. I used to fight and wrestle and wrestle and fight and lose sleep because I didn't understand something. I would just, oh, I would dissect it until I came to an understanding. Some things I never did come to an understanding on. It didn't. It didn't make sense to me at all. And I told God about it. You know, I've preached to you that if you're mad, God already knows that. When you go to prayer with God, just tell him, God, I'm mad at heart right now. Being honest, being truthful, there's power in truth. Giving God a truthful prayer, there's power. It'll make you nervous at first because you're going to think, oh, I can't talk about that. I'm not saying be disrespectful and mean and spiteful. Don't be a teenager with <laughs> you. But be honest with him. I was brutally honest with God one time in my life. You see, my mother passed away. She was old and she was ailing and she was sick and, and hospice called and we all gathered around and we were staying at my sister's house and watching mom. Just take her last few breaths. We knew it was coming. We, we knew that. It was, it was hard. It was painful. It was one of the hardest things I've ever watched. It was my mom. And I had to move away. I was the only one that moved away. I was so far away from home. And I, there was a lot of times I missed her Christmas dinners because I couldn't get a home. And there was a lot of times I missed family functions because I couldn't get home. And there was a spirit of guilt that came over me. They thought, I, you know what? The church understands mom's passing away. That I have no responsibilities. But Brother Mark, Brother George, someone's going to step up and take care of this for me. I, I'm home. I'm with mama. I'm not leaving. She brought me into this world, and I'm going to hold her hand when she leaves it. That was my goal. That's what I wanted. And this is not what I got. Mama was passing away. We get a phone call. I heard my sister say, Michael, Grandma's passing away right now. He's busy. He's, he's in the room with Grandma. And then I heard her say, oh, okay, okay, hold on. Thad, can you come take this call? I said, no, I'm not leaving Mama's side. She said, trust me, you need to take this call. So I run and I get on the phone and Michael says, Thad, I don't know what to do. Rob's gone. I said, she's probably on her way over here right now, Michael. Don't worry about it. Just get in your car and come over here. Your grandma's passing away. He said, no, you don't understand. She's gone. I said, you don't understand. I don't have time. Maybe she went to the store or something. I don't know, but mom's passing away. He said, Uncle Seth. Robin's dead. That was my sister's daughter. I said, you're kidding me. He said, no, and I, I need you. I can't, I can't go. I can't do this. I can't do this. I need you. So I left mom. Went to Michael and Rob's house. I identified the body of my niece. I got Michael and his kids together, put them in my truck, and headed back to my sister's house. Where I was going to have to tell her that we've lost mom and you've lost your daughter on the same day. And I didn't understand that. I struggled. I preached at funeral. Both of them laid. Some of you went. Mom and my niece, both at the same time, laid out in the same room. I was tough. And I didn't understand it. I did not understand that. And, and it aggravated me. It kept me awake. It made me mad. And I went to God and I said, I don't understand what this is about. How? Wow, God. That's tough. Two of them in one day. And it's not like they were in a car together and got in a crash and both of them. It was two totally different deaths. Two totally different circumstances in two totally different places, but both at the same time. I don't understand this, God. Give me clarity. Give me a reason. I 
finally got my reason. It wasn't too long after that that the Fargo's lost two people on the same day. And I got called to minister to them. Had God not walked me through what he walked me through, I would have never been able to have been a servant of God and blessed that family. Because I would have never been able to understand their pain or how to feel. There are times when we are complex, perplexed. But don't let it bring despair. Persecuted but not forsaken. Cast down but not destroyed. We're all still here. Amen? Every assignment that the devil has put out against you, you can shout hallelujah because you're still here. Amen. Praise His holy name. You haven't fallen. You haven't laid down. You haven't given up. Your faith is still strong. Your belief is still intact. You're still a warrior for God. You're still a prayer warrior for God. You're still trusting in the truth. You're still here. The devil and all of his angels and their attacks that fall on you daily, they might knock you around. They might cut you up. They might bruise you. You might be tired. You might feel weak. But praise his holy name. You're still here. Amen. Say this with me. I'm still here. Amen. Uh, we're all like a bunch of bad pennies. We just won't go away. Amen. Verse 10. Always bearing about in the body the dying of our Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. You see, this is about glorifying God. Jesus said, you're the light of the world. You don't, no man lights a candle and puts it under a bushel, but he puts it on a candle stand so that it lights up the whole room. He said, you are the light of the world. You, 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 you. You, Melba. You're the light of the world. He said, now let your light so shine. Why? So that people might say, boy, Melba, she's just a godly little woman. When I grow up, I want to be just like her. No. That's not why you do it. Don't do it so that people will see how good and righteous you are. He said so that they might see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. When you walk by faith, when you walk in encouragement, when you walk in courage and strength and faith, that gives honor and glory to God. The world doesn't understand that. They're so used to being beat down and tried to fall and broken and bruised that if you don't have some kind of sad story, they can't connect with you. But praise God, you got a happy story. Amen. Your story used to be sad, but God. Amen. Every time you interject, but God, then there's something good about to happen. Your story used to be sad. Your story used to be crushing your story. But God, but God intervened. And now you've got a testimony. You can't have a testimony if you ain't tested. That you've been tested. And you come out the victor on the other side because of Jesus Christ. And now you have a testimony. Share it for the glory of God. Our world needs it. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh, so that death worketh in us, but life in you. I'm going to close here in just a minute, but I want to ask you a question. After reading those verses of Scripture, letting God's truth get in. What if? What if? What if? What if for today God were to open up a window in heaven and speak with an audible voice? What if he just said that? Sit down for a minute. You're doing a good job, son, but I want that. So just sit down and I'm physically going, what if, what if God 
interrupted the service, sat me down, opened the window of heaven, just came and stood before you. What if Jesus was right before you right now? And he said, Your heart will heal. What if Jesus said, Your tears will dry? What if Jesus said, Your season will change? What if He said, Your heart will heal? Your tears will dry. Your season will change. Rest. Knowing that your storm will end. Mm. Gosh, that puts Holy Ghost thoughts on the back of my neck. It's them, man. Yeah, I'm glad they said that. Your heart will heal. Psalm 34 18. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart and save as such as be of a contrite spirit. In the scripture I looked for I looked for biblical examples of those who, who might have had a broken heart. That Jesus took over and healed their heart. And I thought about the father with the prodigal son, the wayward son, the sinful son. We all have someone in our homes, someone in our families that are lost and undone that need Jesus. Maybe it's a son, maybe it's a grandson, maybe it's a daughter, maybe it's a granddaughter. Someone we love, someone we care about. Maybe it's a mom, maybe it's a dad. We can all connect with this father of the prodigal son. What I want to point out to you about that father is that he stayed focused on God's character. You see, God also loved you when you were wayward, when you were lost, when you were prodigal. When you were getting it wrong, when you were overcome with sin, when you were making your own choices, God didn't give up on you. God didn't become a basket case. God didn't weep and cry and say, oh, there's no hope for him, there's no hope for her. God's character is a character of love and faith. And this father, in the story of the prodigal son, he pictures God's character because every day, he stood and he watched and he waited for that boy to come back home. He believed in a promise, train up a child in the way they should go. And when he's old, he'll not depart from it. He believed that his boy was going to come back home and be reunited with the family. They were going to put a robe on him and shoes on his feet and ring on his finger. They were going to blow the trumpets. They were going to kill the fatted calf. They were going to be rejoicing. And it didn't look like that, but that's what he believed. You know God felt that way about you. He had the angels prepared around the great throne of God because he knew that one day, one, one day, there was going to be a preacher stand before you. He was going to declare the gospel of Jesus Christ. You would receive that truth and you'd go home to be with God. And the angels would put a robe on you and put a ring on your finger and kill it fat and calf because there would be rejoicing in heaven around the throne of God for one prodigal that made its way home. That one prodigal was you. That one prodigal was me. Mm. Amen. I know that you're concerned for your loved ones. And I know that your hearts might be broken. But your heart will heal your heart will heal. To the misunderstood. How about that man that was born blind? His church turned out. Well, you were born blind. How did you receive your sight? A man named Jesus anointed my eyes, told me to go and wash. I did it, and I came back saying, Tell the truth or we'll kick you out of the synagogue. We know that God heareth not sinners, and this man is a sinner. Tell us again, how did you receive your sight? He said, I've already told you once and you didn't believe me. What makes me think you're going to believe me if I tell you again? Well, tell us again. All right, I'll tell you again. There was a man named Jesus. He anointed my eyes with clay. 
out of the spittle. He spit in the dirt and he made clay and he anointed my eyes with it. Then he told me to go over and wash in the pool. And I washed in the pool and my eyes were open and now I come back seeing. They kicked him out of the synagogue. He was totally misunderstood. They didn't understand him. His church turned on him. His town gossiped about him. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's not the guy that was born blind. He looks like him. I ain't, ain't going to deny it. He really looks like that guy that was born blind, but that couldn't have been him. That's not him. That's somebody else. This is just a lie. Just a hoax. He's just trying to get attention. Ain't that something? They should have been rejoicing with him. He received his sight, but instead, hmm, his own parents wouldn't even support him. They came to his parents and said, is this your son? They said, yes, this is our son. And was he born blind? He was absolutely born blind. Then how did they receive his sight? You see, they were afraid of getting kicked out of the church. Religion meant more to them than their son. When you put religion on such a pedestal that it takes precedence over those that you love, you got problems. How can you say that, preacher? You're a pastor. Because I can't stand religion. The only thing that belongs to you on that pedestal in your life is Jesus Christ. All this legalistic, religious stuff that causes families to turn on one another, when you get right down to the root of it, it's just religion, and we need to lose religion and just get Jesus. Amen. His family wouldn't even support him. He had no validation. They said, he's of age. Go ask him. Hmm. Wow. You know, so many people's lives are torn up today because they don't feel that they're validated. We don't need to be validated. You're a son of God. You're a daughter of God. Your name's recorded in the Lamb's Book of Life. Heaven is your home. You're validated. If you wait until this world loves you, you're going to be waiting until the cows come home. You don't need all this validation and all the stuff that the world is promoting today. You're stronger than that. Some people, you know, I've been asked before. Being a pastor isn't the easiest thing in the world. It's the most rewarding thing that I've ever done. But it's not always the easiest thing in the world. Sometimes people will hate you for just no reason at all. And my wife asked me one time, how in the world can you sleep at night knowing so many people just have a hatred for you. I said, well, it's pretty easy. I just put my hands behind my head and close my eyes and sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Not everybody has to like you. Right. And you don't need to be validated over everything. If your boss don't pat you on the back at the end of every day and tell you a job, listen, I know it. I know it feels good when the boss acknowledges you every now and again and says, hey, today you did a, did a bang up job. That feels good. I like it, but I don't have to hear it. We don't have to be validated. If your wife loves you, if your husband loves you, if your children are mad and crazy about you, if you've got grandchildren, if you've got love in this world, if you've got Jesus, you've got everything that you need. Don't listen to the world and its lies that it's promoting about all this validation and self-esteem and all this stuff. It's a lie from the pit of hell. And it's designed to make you feel bad about who you are. You're a, you're a member of the kingdom of God. You're royal priesthood. A peculiar. You want to know why you're peculiar to this world? Because stuff like validation doesn't matter to you. And they don't get it. What did Paul say? The truth is hidden to those that are lost. But you said, I'm not lost. You got this. Amen. 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 But he held his integrity and he held his faith in Jesus. Mm. Huh? There's people in our world that are judged. What about the woman that was caught in the very act of adultery? You see, we judge people based on our own opinions. We judge people based on other people's testimony about the person that we're judging. Well, I heard what they said about him, and I tell you, man, that's the truth. Well, how do 
do you know it's the truth? Did you see it? Did you hear it? Were you there? Do you know? Well, no, but they said it. Now that's a good source. Please. Let all, the Bible says, let all men be alive. But let God be the truth. If you didn't see it, if you didn't hear it, if you weren't there, if you don't know, then you don't know. How about the judged that are in this world? That woman caught in the dark. In adultery, you know, we judge based on opinion, upon testimony, upon perception, on how we see things. And that's all outward stuff. We see only action, but Jesus sees the heart. Amen. Here's some truth for you. Usually, usually there are reasons deep-seated reasons for a person's outward actions. There was something that was testified and talked about here today. I'm not going to bring it back up, but I'm going to trust the Holy Spirit will minister to the heart. There are people in our world that are going through great pain. There are people in our world that are going living life burdened by regrets. Looking back upon the things they've done, the things they've said, the things that have happened to them, and their life is so full of pain and sorrow and regret and anger and grief. There's some people in our world right now that are so grief stricken. Don't you know? Don't you get it? Remember a time when you were in pain. Okay? Go back there. Put yourself in this. You are back in 1982 or whatever it was that happened, and you are in the greatest pain that you've ever been in your life. A pain that just won't go away. You wept and you cried, but you were crying so hard that it was just like... And no sound came. Have you ever wept so hard that sound didn't even come out of your mouth? I have. And it's not pretty and it's not fun. I want you to go back into that time, into that place. Preacher, I don't want to go there. It's too hurtful. It's too painful. I know. But Jesus said, take, Jesus told Martha and Mary, take me where you lay, Jesus. Take me where, take me where something died. Go back to that place where something on the inside of you died. The pain was so horrible. Go back there. Go back there. Just for a moment. You don't have to stay there, but go back there. Go back to that moment where, 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 where you were hurting so bad that your mind started to roll and you started to think about things and then all of a sudden, boom, this burden of regret just fell upon you. Oh, if I just had one more chance. Oh, if I just had one more day. Oh, if I just. Now not only are you suffering with pain, but regret is kicking your tail. And then you get angry. Why did this have to happen? Why am I going through this? Lord, I pray. Lord, I read my Bible. Lord, I went to church. Why? The anger sets in. And it's all wrapped around the spirit of grief. And then all of a sudden, your heart is so heavy that the only thing you can feel is depression. And no joy. No happiness. No peace. I don't know if you've never been there before, but I have many times. There's been times where I've wept all the way to church and wiped my face in the parking lot so that I could come in here and smile and preach an encouraging message to you. Shake your hands and say, thank you for coming out. I hope you have a blessed week. Get back in my truck and weep all the way I, I know what that feels like. You know what that feels like. And when we're under that kind of pressure, when you were under that kind of pressure, did you get it right? Were you a little bit hard to deal with? Were you a little bit snappy and snippy with people? Did you act out of character? Just once. I mean, just once. You see, what we don't understand is we judge what we see. Man, that's a bitter person. We judge what we see. Man, that's a horrible attitude. We judge what we see. But we only see what we see. Jesus sees the heart. Amen. Jesus knows and Jesus understands. Jesus understood you. And Jesus loved you. And Jesus protected you. And Jesus restored you. 
Today, today you're you're like, woo, God's good. <laughs> if you only knew what God brought me through back in 1982, I don't know why I keep saying 82. 82 was a good year for me. If you only knew what God did for me back then, you'd understand why I'm so full of joy and so happy today. It just blessed my heart so much to hear you today, sis, because you were so exuberant about what God did for you in this last week. But you had weeks before that were not like that. But God brought you through. Amen. Amen. And God brought you through. God brought this woman. Caught in the act of adultery through. They were going to kill her. He said, woman, well, where are those thy accusers now? Is any man? She, was, she said, no man, Lord. He said, neither do I. Now you just go. Sin no more. You see, me and you would have been standing there with a stone in her hand. Oh, she's guilty. She's guilty. I mean, they caught her. She's guilty. There ain't no denying it. And Jesus said, wait a minute. Okay, Chad, you ain't never in your life come into this hand. So go ahead and throw your rock. Chad's one of the most godly people I know. But even Chad has to drop the rock. There's people in our world that need their hearts healed. They're misunderstood. They're judged. It's horrible. There's people that feel used and they feel abused. Jesus is the best example I can give of this. He was ridiculed constantly. He was talked about and lied on. He was discredited. He, he was cast out after, after delivering that man. Demon possessed, and he cast them. You know those people in that community. He that that demon possessed man was a was a horror to them. And they tried to change. They tried to fix the situation, but they couldn't. They chained him, and he broke the chains. So they cast him out of town, put him out there in the tombs where he'd be away. But even then, it was like, oh my goodness! At nighttime, you could hear him out there wailing from the tombs. That would have been enough to scare me to move to another town. I'm just gonna tell you. They wanted this man to be made whole. They, they wanted the devils out of him. And Jesus showed up and he cast the devils out. And the devil said, suffer us not to go back to hell. Lord, put us into them pigs. You want to know something? If you're here today lost and undone, Jesus Christ is your answer. He'll forgive every sin you've ever committed. You need to trust in him because there really is a heaven and there really is a hell. But hell can't be all that bad, preacher. That's where all my friends are going. Just going to be one big party. Hear me today. Them demons beg Jesus, don't send us back to that place. If a demon don't want to be there, it's got to be a pretty bad place. Jesus cast those demons out into the pigs. And the pigs ran off a cliff and drowned in the sea. Now these people, came back to Jesus and said, you destroyed the pigs. We don't want you here. Go to another village. Go to another town. Go where you don't have to go home, but you got to go. You see, we want God's grace, but not at the cost of our pigs. We want God's salvation, but not what's going to cost us it. Hmm. He was betrayed. Judas betrayed him. Judas was one of his closest friends. Walked with him, traveled with him, ate with him, ministered with him. He was there. Judas was one of the disciples. Judas betrayed him. And we all have Judases in our life. You've either had a Judas or you've got a Judas or you're about to meet a Judas. But sooner or later, there's going to be a Judas in your life that's going to lie to you, that's going to lie on you, that's going to cheat you, that's going to take you. we got people in our world that are grieving. Martha and Mary lost their brother. Jesus wept with them. He saw their broken heart. The Bible says, the Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart and say to such that we have a contract spirit. Today, Jesus is saying to you, 
your heart will heal. Today, He's saying to you, your tears will dry. Revelation 21, 14 says, And God shall wipe away all the tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And again in Psalms 30, verse 5, it says, For His anger endureth for a moment, and in His favor, in His favor, favor is grace, in His grace is life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. To the grieving, I want to tell you, God restores. And your tears will dry. Jesus is standing before you today. And He's telling you your heart will heal. Your tears will dry. And your season will change. It will. It will. It will. For the Bible says, Ecclesiastes 3, verses 1 through 8, to everything there is a season, and a time to every purpose under heaven, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to pluck up that which is planted, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to break down, and a time to build up, a time to weep, and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones, and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to get and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to cast away, and a time to rend and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time of war and a time of peace. And I'm about out of breath. Is there anything else that we can think of that there would be a time for? I think God covered it all in the book of Ecclesiastes. There's a time for everything and a season for everything under the heaven. But every season gives way to a new one. It's been a good summer. It's about to be a good fall. No such thing as a good winter, but it's coming. <laughs> I'm going to be summer again. Every season gives way to a new one. Your season will change. And your storm won't last. Praise this holy name of God. I'm so blessed this morning. I'm so very blessed this morning. Look at here, I'm putting this all up. I promise you I'm going to close. But I want to close with this. There hath no temptation taken you. There's no, there's no trial. There's no trouble. There's no valley. There's no circumstance. There's no situation. Some of you have been through some horrible circumstances and situations. But if you believe the Bible, receive its truth. This will free you. There hath been no trial, circumstance, the Bible says temptation, taking you, but such as is common to men. There's others that have gone before you. And then we are out. There's others that are in it with you. And there's others to come. You're not alone. You're never alone. But God is faithful. Who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you might be able to bear it. And Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. And I am the life. Trust Jesus. Your heart will find you. Praise His Holy. I feel like I've preached my message. Let's rise to our feet. Maybe today your heart needs to be healed. Will you see Jesus this morning? I want every head to be bowed, I want every eye to be closed. Maybe today, maybe today your, your heart needs healing. Over hurt, over something. You just don't think it's ever going to heal. Jesus can heal your heart today and take away that. 
today, would you receive the truth of this message and just go to Jesus Christ through prayer? Maybe you're here today lost and have nothing and you need to be saved. Maybe you're watching over the internet and you need to be saved. Go to Him. There's no sin more powerful than the blood of Jesus Christ. Your broken heart over the sin that you've committed can be healed with one simple prayer. Lord, I believe. Forgive me and save me. Make me your own. Maybe today you are saved. There's something in your life that has caused your pain in your heart. Is hurting. Jesus, He will heal your heart. He'll bring you through this season. Your storm will not stay. I promise you, it won't. So put your hand out to receive Jesus Christ and receive this message today. Let the truth be your power. And stand up. Smile. Laugh. It's okay. It's okay. Just laugh. And receive God's grace and God's mercy. Father God, I come to you today in the name of Jesus Christ and I thank you for your word of truth. There's so much of myself in today's message. So many things that you showed me in my walk with you. And I just want to be able to share that other people, encourage them, and hopefully lead them to grasp the truth that we share with them. There's so many hurting people, there's so many confused people in the world today. I just pray for each and every one that's here, that's hearing my voice. Search their hearts, Lord, and hear them when they pray today. I'm not even, not even going to ask for a show of hands, I'm just going to let you do what you do. You said in your word that if you be lifted up, you draw all men. I've lifted you today. Draw these to you. Touch their hearts. Save their souls. Forgive their sins. Heal their bodies. Encourage them. Edify them. Lift them up. Bless the Lord. And I'll give you the praise. Father, I love these people, each and every one. And I know that you do too. So I'm going to ask you once again, Lord, please keep them all safe from harm's way. Bring us back at our next appointed time where once again we can worship you in spirit and in truth. All honor, glory, worship, and praise we give to thee. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.